the historical and spiritual connections between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. I'm actually going to start with the spiritual or the religious connections and then talk about um, the historical ones. So uh, I wanted to start by asking you, um, what do these, given what you've learned so far, what do these three religions have in common, religiously speaking? What do they share? One God. All right, so they are monotheistic. Uh-huh, so they are often called the Abrahamic traditions, right? Oops, can't spell on the board. I'm sorry? Yes, so they have, um, a, let's say, uh, Judaism, Judaism is not more than that. An eschatological consciousness. This world is not all there is. I'm taking that and I'm making it a big <laughs> word. All right, so uh, what else do they have in common? Prophets. Right, so in my university, we teach a course on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I do sometimes. And uh, it's called Near Eastern Religions, right? Because they share. Geographic. The Near East. Now, I'm not going to talk about what a problem the Near East is, because if you're in China, the Near East is not the Near East. But anyway, leave aside the Eurocentric uh, thing. OK, so Near Eastern traditions, they share a sacred geography. Yes? Codes of conduct. So um, I'm basically putting the outline of my lecture up here. So anyway, um, they are monotheisms, but they are sometimes called the ethical monotheisms, which is, I think, what you are getting at, that there's a code of conduct that goes along uh, with this in the world, right? So I'm going to put those, let's say, uh, In a way, it would. I would say that they both share um, a, uh, obviously, they, they both share a belief in God. I can't just change that word like that, right? Monotheistism is not a word. Uh -huh. All right, there we go. All right, um, but they do share um, a belief in an agent of evil, right? An agent of at least temptation or mischief. Uh, which all three traditions refer to by various names, but uh, one common one between them is Satan, or in Arabic, shaitan. Might be the same in Hebrew, I'm not sure. In Job, in Job, the book of Job, Satan is the one that comes to God and says, you know, Job's a good guy, but, you know, make his life a little hard and see what happens, right? So he's the, he, he shows up in Job. Yeah. Not in the not in the tour, but you, are you the yes, yes, yes. Dietary restrictions. Okay, so just forget it. I can't spell. You know that says dietary restrictions. All right. Yes. Scripture. Yes. They are all scriptural traditions. Okay, so they all share the concept of a prophet. Uh, so I would say prophecy, although it does not mean the same thing. So all of these things they share, what I hope to show you is while they share them, there are also really important differences to make sure that you understand uh, that distinction. So prophecy, uh, and we might say sacred history. In what sense of conversion? Well, you can now, but it was not. Um, it doesn't have. It doesn't have the same kind of um, central role, right? Muslims and Christians uh, have always historically felt, at least some subsection of them, compelled to bring other people to Christianity and Islam, and it's not quite the same in Judaism. Although today, yes, you can. Um, 
I don't know, maybe in Orthodox Judaism, but certainly in, in Reform and Conservative Judaism, you can convert. Yes? Uh, holy days. Holy days. So a sacred calendar. Right? And all of these things I might put under a ritual, right? So their rituals are very much the same, but the, the, the idea that they share rituals like dietary restrictions or holidays, sacred uh, days, those would be things that you might find in a wide variety of religious traditions, right? Not just those three religious traditions. And to some extent, other things as well, right? They all, uh, all three traditions pray, they all fast, they have dietary restrictions, they all give charity. In some forms, it's in, in, in some traditions, it's more formal than others, but charity is something that is valued uh, in all three traditions. They all have some form of pilgrimage, but it doesn't have exactly the same status, right? It's a requirement in Islam if you can do it to make the pilgrimage, uh, whereas pilgrimage in Judaism or Christianity might be something a, a, a pious person would be very interested in doing, but doesn't have, it's not commanded to do it, and so on. So in many ways, a lot of, um, uh, there's a, a really interesting German theologian I met who has a, a strange theory about religion called, he calls it the fractal theory of religion. Uh, and his view is that um, every, we would call it in religious studies, every phenomenological aspect of religion, every sort of type of practice or belief that emerges in one religion can be found in the other religions, but not always with the same signification or emphasis. Right, so pilgrimage is in all three, but it's huge in Islam and not as big in Judaism and Christianity and so forth, right? So again, same thing with conversion, right? You would say that con conversion is a very big thing in Islam and Christianity. They're in Judaism, but not emphasized, right? Okay. All right, so these are things that connect the, the religions for sure, and they... they uh, are important bases for interfaith dialogue and interfaith understanding. Um, but at the same time, it's important to realize that there are, uh, they also, things that bring people together can also be things over which they argue, over which they disagree, even at times over which they fight. Right, so I think that's uh, important to remember. Okay, so let's start with the fact that they share uh, a sacred geography. So they emerge in the Near East, the Middle East, West Asia, whatever you want to call it, this part of the world that we are, we familiarly call uh, the Middle East. So you know that for Muslims, obviously, uh, Mecca is the most sacred city, right? It's the center of the world. Uh, for Muslims, religiously speaking, it's where they turn to when they pray, it's where they make pilgrimage to. Um, Medina, though, also is very uh, sacred to Muslims because that's where Muhammad dies. In fact, even after Mecca is conquered for Islam, he doesn't stay there, which is kind of interesting, right? He goes back and he dies in Medina, and that's where he's buried. Uh, but some of you probably also know that Jerusalem is a sacred city for Muslims, right? It's usually considered to be the third holiest city for Muslims, and it's referenced in various ways in the Quran itself as a sacred land, as a sacred territory, and as having a sacred bait. You can see here, this one says bait al-Quds. Al-Quds is the Arabic for um, Jerusalem, and it means sacred. That's what Quds means, right? And so Beit al-Quds is the, is the sacred house or the house of the sacred city, um, referring uh, to uh, the, uh, the temple that was originally uh, there and now, of course, uh, the Dome of the Rock. So how is it that Jerusalem um, becomes uh, a sacred city in Islam? <laughs> Right, so he goes, Muhammad is taken toward the end of his time in Mecca. He uh, goes on a miraculous journey, which is really totally unique in the whole Muslim history of Muhammad's life. There's nothing like it. But he's taken from Mecca, um, and he's taken all the way to Jerusalem uh, to the remains, the site of the ruins of the Jewish temple. Right? And at this time, the Jewish temple has been in ruins for centuries. It is a trash heap, actually.
actually. Um, and, but he goes to that site, and it's believed that from the site where the Holy of Holies stood in the origi original Solomonic Temple, Muhammad ascended through the seven heavens, and he met a variety of prophets who are all biblical prophets. Right. So Moses, Jesus, Joseph, Abraham, um, and eventually comes into a kind of communication or conversation, which is very mysterious, uh, with God. Okay. After that experience, which you'll probably hear more about in the lectures about the life of Muhammad, but after that experience, uh, Muhammad realizes, maybe much more intensely than he did before, how connected the religion the revelation he's receiving is to the Jewish and Christian tradition. To the point that when he comes back from this, famously, he instructs his followers to cease directing their prayers toward the Kaaba and Mecca and to turn and direct their prayers toward Jerusalem. And this is around the year 619. So it's about two, two and a half years before Muhammad uh, goes to Medina. 